Welcome to I'll Go If You Go, a Save the Redwoods League podcast. We're building community and illuminating how Californians from all walks of life think about and experience nature and conservation in the Redwoods and beyond. I'll go if you go, because when we explore together in community, the experience is all the more powerful. For this final episode of the season, Dana Poblete, Marcos Castineras, Caleb Castle, and I, Leslie Parra, will sit down and share some of our stories from the Redwoods and what the phrase, I'll go if you go, means to us. Welcome, Dana, Marcos, and Caleb. I'd love to ask y'all to introduce yourselves, how you identify, and what your role is at the league. Hi, my name is Marcos Castineras. I go by he, him pronouns. I'm a Latino immigrant from Argentina and currently serving as the digital marketing manager at Save the Redwoods League. Some of my favorite hobbies are hiking with my dog, kayaking, and of course, playing football. Vele, football. And uh, hi, I'm Caleb Castle, and I go by uh, he, him, and they, them pronouns. I'm uh, I'm white and of uh, mixed European descent, including German, Irish, uh, and Welsh. My favorite hobbies uh, include rugby, playing guitar, the trumpet, and art. Um, I am from the East Coast, and I'm now serving as the digital marketing specialist at the league. Hi, everyone. My name is Dana Poblete. I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm an immigrant woman from the island of Luzon in the Philippines. I'm a descendant of revolutionaries, farmers, and indigenous Filipino healers, and I am the writer, storyteller, and editor at Save the Redwoods League. Uh, For hobbies, I love skateboarding, surfing, and just playing outside. Hi, everyone. I am Leslie Parra, the Outreach Program Manager for Save the Redwoods League. I'm originally from Ecuador, grew up in North Carolina, came out to California for a master's in conservation biology and said to myself, I want to see more of us in this field. And that is how I started this path. And I would love to share with you all about how this idea of the podcast came to be. As an outreach program manager, I know that uh, building relationships is is the most important thing. And for me, the key ingredient of building relationships is conversation. And that is something that not even COVID can stop us from doing. As I see it, this is the only way that we can gain understanding and discover about each other's interests and challenges that we face in the realm of conservation and outdoor recreation. It's the only way that we can really cultivate a trusting relationship. And through it, I think that we can work together to build an equitable future in the outdoors. For this final episode of season one of the podcast, I wanted to make some space for us here, the League family, to tell some stories. Marcos, if you would, please share with us one of your favorite Redwood stories. Yeah. One of my best experiences was my first trip up north about three years ago during the spring, my partner and I went to see the old growth redwoods at Humboldt State Park. And I still remember how amazing it was walking in absolute silence on this trail lined with sorrel and ferns below these giant redwoods. It was awesome. And on top of that, I saw a banana slug for the first time. It was pretty cool. And later that day, we met this massive herd of elks outside the place that we were camping at. It was such a fun and unforgettable trip. Wow, that sounds awesome. Did you happen to touch that slug? No, we just contemplated its beauty. They are pretty cool to look at. And then for the first time when you see one, it's, it's pretty amazing. Isn't there a thing about people licking banana slugs? Yes. I've never done it, but 
I've heard it's uh, it's something that if you're uh, in Santa Cruz or a student of Santa Cruz University, you have you, you you have to do it. Well, now I'm very curious to know what's the flavor. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't isn't it a hallucinogen also? I don't know, but I'm going to find out next time. Yeah, I say we all try it. <laughs> I say we all go out and try it. Okay, Caleb, would you like to share your story? So um, recently, a coworker said to me that uh, the redwoods slow you down. It's what they do. And the first time I saw the redwoods, I was in a hurry. Having never been to California, I hugely underestimated the enormous size and massive scale of California's vast landscapes, let alone the northern half of it. And a person that I met in my travels had made a recommendation to take just a slight detour on the Highway 1 North. Uh, And I didn't arrive to the Avenue of Giants off the 101 North until it was nearly dusk. It took us almost eight hours or four hours out of our way. Um, And I'd only planned two days to drive to Seattle, so I was flooring it to catch my flight. Uh, But still, I had to pause and pull over and look up and look around. And the forest was dark and dank, but towering overhead. And I just stared totally agape at these stunning ancient trees and their, their presence. I was just in awe as I drove beneath the canopy and then through a tree trunk. And I couldn't stop for long, but I drank in the sights from that road trip and I vowed to return. So five years later, um, when I I next returned, this time it was in heartbreak. At the time, my relationship had uh, ended and I needed a new beginning. So I knew immediately I'd be heading to California for an adventure and uh, where I could start over in a beautiful and inspiring place. So I resigned from my marketing position with a for-profit, which I wasn't passionate about, and bought a one-way ticket to San Francisco. Uh, Shortly thereafter, um, and freshly grieving the loss of that former relationship, I visited Muir Woods for the first time and felt grounded for the first time in weeks since my move. The energy of the Redwoods supported me, and uh, I've been back many times since then. Each time has been rejuvenating. The calm and peaceful energy just washes over me and it refills my well. Six years later, I'm now working for Save the Redwoods League. And we are so lucky to have you, Caleb. I'm sorry about your relationship, but I guess I'm not too sorry because we got you now. No, it's all in the past. (laughs) That's right. Pasado, pisado. Um, Dana, please share us one of your favorite Redwood stories. Sure. So for some reason... The thing I always remember the most about redwood forests is the way that they smell and they all smell different. I guess redwood leaves don't really smell like much compared to other evergreen leaves, but the entire forest, depending on where you are, always has a different scent to me. So the first time I ever experienced the redwoods, I was driving through Big Sur And for those who've never been to Big Sur, you've got this lush forest on one side and like a vast seascape on the other side. And you're driving down these winding cliffs on Highway 1. Um, So my partner and I were in our little convertible with the top down. And as we approached Pfeiffer Big Sur State Park, it smelled like my dream. Like it smelled like kelp and salty air and earth and evergreen leaves and with just a little hint of campfire. And I don't know, maybe that sounds like a weird smell to some people, but I'm an island person. So for me, it smelled like heaven. And another time I was in a very different kind of forest in Prairie Creek State Park. And I was walking with a ranger through these ancient redwoods that were also coexisting with these big leaf maples and bay trees. And it smelled like rain and damp earth and California Bay, which is one of my favorite scents to this day. And then at that moment, the ranger pulled a leaf off of a bay tree and tore it open and handed it to me. And it was one of the most intense fragrances I've ever smelled. So I think my point is I love the redwoods, but to me, the redwoods are even more glorious in the context of the whole environment that they live in. They are a part of a larger community, you know, a rich and diverse community that bolsters their existence. 
Definitely. And I think you're onto something here, Dana. Maybe, maybe there's a perfume in the making here. Yeah. Some sort of perfume or cologne, Redwoods. Yes. I've smelled like Redwood scented candles and Sequoia scented candles, but nothing has captured that real natural smell of the forest. So we're going to go into business together, you and me, Leslie. Absolutely. I, I'd love to get a scent of that going. All right. Well, my turn. I'm going to share one of my favorite Redwoods experiences. Um, it was the time that I visited Oakland Redwoods Regional Park during the winter to witness its ladybug breeding season. I'm not sure if you guys have seen that, but it is amazing. And I don't know about you all, but I love ladybugs. I love them when they land on my shoulder. I love it just watching them fly away. Uh, they're so cute and they actually are pretty great vicious predators. They eat and they eat and survive by eating um, pests like aphids. Anyway, they were everywhere, thousands of them along the trail, the shrubs, the branches, just having a great old time breeding, having a party, which happens to be every winter between the months of November through February. So please, please, if you get a chance and you're in the area, check them out. It's amazing. And, um, and it's like you said, you know, it's, 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 it's great to see the redwoods and I love them. And, and I love like to see the actual whole ecosystem when we're in there. And during this time, you get to see, um, this particular species, the late, the beetle, the ladybug beagle, beetle really blossom and, 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 and just, you appreciate it more by watching that biology take place, like by watching them do their thing. Um, yes, it was awesome and I highly recommend it. Explore Redwoods is your portal into California's magical coast redwood and giant sequoia forests. Visit exploreredwoods.org to learn what's available in more than 100 redwood parks and plan an unforgettable adventure. From hiking and biking trails to camping to swimming holes, this web-based app will get you there. Visit exploreredwoods.org. Okay, so now we're going to move into the name of our podcast, which by the way, thank you, Dana, you came through with a great name for this podcast. And what does that name mean to us? What does I'll go if you go mean to us? Um, so for me, I immediately loved it when I heard it because it signifies trust. It's a phrase that you would only say to someone that you trust. It implies that you're a hundred percent in if the other person is in as well. It doesn't matter if neither of you have tried it or have been there as long as you're experiencing it together. That's all that matters is that you have each other's back if anything happens. And when I think about it, a lot of my international traveling has been around this, I'll go if you go. It's like, neither of us have been there, but we're both in and, we, and we'll and we check things together and we'll have each other's back. We'll, we'll keep each other safe. And when I think about it in, in Spanish too, there's a phrase that um, we say, it's like, vamos pues vamos. It's like, you're in, I'm in. So I, and again, when I backpacked through Ecuador, I asked my cousins, I'm like, come on, let's, let's go check out a lot of places that I haven't seen. Um, and, and you usually ask somebody that you trust when you, when you're asking them if, if, you know, to check out a new place. So for me, it's, it's really about that, um, that trusting feeling of like, yes, this person has my back and we're going to be okay experiencing it together. Um, Dana, would you, would you love to share like what I'll go if you go means to you? Yeah. Um, so everything you said, obviously, but also for me, I'll go if you go is about connection and kinship and solidarity and really being willing to take a leap of faith together. So I want to share a story actually that my dad told me recently about when he was little and he was the middle child out of three kids at the time. And I should note that he eventually would have eight siblings. My grandmother was a very strong woman. Full house. Yes, full house, which is why um, my grandfather was in charge of this little thing that they used to do, which is when, whenever one of the kids was sick, 
he would take all the kids to the beach because he believed the ocean had healing power. And my grandfather, my great, sorry, my great grandfather was a sort of shaman. So my grandfather probably carried some of that traditional knowledge. So here was my grandfather with one child hanging on his shoulders and one in his arms and the other one at his feet. And they're taking a boat at dawn down the river to the ocean. And these were some of my dad's fondest memories, just these moments with the family experiencing healing through nature. And my grandfather was a farmer at the time. So back then they were so poor. My dad said sometimes all they had to eat with their rice was salt water or sugar water. But he said, despite that, they were so happy because they were always together. They were so close and they were home. Mm -hmm. Um, So eventually we all moved to the U.S. because my grandfather enlisted in the U.S. Navy and neither he or my dad really wanted to leave our homeland, but it was just the best decision for the whole family at the time. So all 20 of us, we were a village and so we all made this new life together in this new place. Oh, that's, all, that's a beautiful story. And, and everybody was, yeah, I'll go if you go. <laughs> and we all went. <laughs> Y'all went. That's great. Marcos, would you like to share what I'll go if you go means to you? Yes. For me, I'll go if you go relates to circumstances in life when things get a bit complicated and you need to sort an obstacle or make a change, and you realize that there are other people walking similar paths and also people willing to support you or take the risk with you to go if you go. In my case, I immigrated five years ago, and many times I experienced the lack of a sense of belonging, and it took some time, but I was lucky to have people who inspire me and share that process with me without changing who I am. And I have to say that going to the woods also helped me because when you walk in those ancient forests, you know that our ancestors walked there, that those places are for everyone and there are no labels there. Absolutely. And it also reminds me of what Caleb mentioned in one of our last conversations about the forest being, it, it, it's welcoming to everyone and you, and you come as you are. Exactly. And, and that just, that's so true. And and if we all come as we are, and if we all accept each other for who we are, gosh, this world would be so much better. Caleb, would you please share with us your Algo If You Go story or, you know, what it means to you? Yeah, I appreciate hearing these stories from each one of you, um, which really just, again, drives home that, that point that you just made, Leslie, um, you know, that we all belong in nature, in these spaces together, and uh, we all deserve to be happy and take risks and be together. So um, I want to tell a story that kind of embodies that. And uh, so late last summer, we learned my uh, fiance's dad had been diagnosed with bladder cancer. And he did not tell us this until after having multiple rounds of treatment. And so as my love, uh, Jordy, is a queer and non-binary person and in a relationship with me, a queer transgender man, unfortunately, we do not have the support of any of their blood relatives. Their relationship with their dad is tenuous. We were disappointed already that we had to uh, move back our May 2021 wedding date out a year And suddenly we didn't know whether or not their dad would make it. Ultimately, he doesn't particularly approve of our plans or relationship anyways. My partner felt orphaned, having no relationship with their mother. And now this from their dad. So this happened days before a planned trip to Stanislaw National Forest. And I said to Jordy, what do you need from me to know that I'm your family? Mm -hmm. Although the trip coincided with the uh, SQF complex wildfires, which were actively breaking out and occurring across the Sierras, we made a big decision and called up our dear friend who is ordained. 
And on a day's notice, this wonderful friend followed us blindly into the forest. We always wanted to get married under the redwoods. So we found a perfect site next to Cherry Lake, a little amphitheater with the raised platform at the base of three second growth sequoias, and we eloped. Hey, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. The next day from Glacier's Point at Yosemite, we watched the creek fire take hold 49 miles south by Shaver Lake as ash fell from the sky. And like a redwood, our new family was forged in the fire. And of course, we promptly cut that trip short and got the heck out of there as fast as we could. And it was risky, but I'll go if you go. Oh, that's beautiful, Caleb. Oh, congratulations. 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 Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm just so happy for you and your partner. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Caleb. And I also am so impressed that you were able to keep that a secret for so long. <laughs> well, thanks for giving me this space to uh, get the news out there. And uh, with the pandemic, we've been unable to share this news with our family, but my family is on a plane and they'll be landing here in about three hours. <gasps> and I look forward to telling them oh. with my spouse. Oh, yes. Congratulations again, Caleb. Thank I'm you. So happy for you. And what's your spouse name? Jordy. And Jordy. Please congratulate Jordy on my behalf and our behalf. Thank you. All right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna switch it up a bit now and do our lightning round. We're gonna go in a circle and ask each other some questions. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and start. To Caleb, sunsets or sunrises? Definitely sunsets. I'm always on time for the sunsets. Yeah, sunsets are pretty awesome. Dana, what's your sign? I'm an Aquarius with an Aries rising. Is it obvious? <laughs> Marcos, sushi or burrito? Burrito, yes. Mission style burritos. Mm-hmm. That's right. Leslie. See, if you had a time machine, would you go back in time or into the future? Back in time, hands down. I'd go check out some dinosaurs and try not to get squished. <laughs> <laughs> I love dinosaurs. <laughs> Dana, if you could turn into an animal for one day, what would it be? Dolphin, hands down. They have the most fun. They're like dogs in water, though, too, aren't they? Yeah, and their brains are like really humongous. Yes, they can. <laughs> they have like a really good vocabulary. Mm -hmm. We just don't know what they're saying. <laughs> like so long, and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> Caleb, eighties, nineties, or aughts? Definitely the nineties for show, for show, for show, for show. In fact, uh, I used to have a radio station and um, I, a show, and it was called uh, The Slow Flow Show for Show. And if you don't know, <laughs> you better ask somebody. I love it. <sighs> Marcos, where is your happy place? My happy place is every time I'm landing on a plane because it means I'm either arriving to Buenos Aires to visit my family or I'm coming back to my wife and dog, mm -hmm. or I'm going somewhere on vacations. That makes me happy too. Win, win, win. Nice. Dana, you have to sing karaoke. What song do you pick? So Marcos, I actually love karaoke. And I am going to go with Super Trooper by ABBA because it's in my vocal range and I can relate to it. And it's such a feel good song. Love it. I love it. I think we should all answer that question if, if, if yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Um, and, and also I want to say that I didn't think you, like, when I sing karaoke, I don't ever think about, like, what my vo vocal range can handle because it's karaoke. <laughs> 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 but I do love to karaoke, and I have a karaoke song that I always do. So, um, What is it? Last Dance, Donna Summer. Ooh. 
Okay. How about you, Caleb? It's always between um, Alanis Morissette, You Ought to Know, and Journey, Don't Stop Believing. <laughs> Those are both great. Those are both great. Marcos, what are you going to sing next time you're in karaoke? I always try not to go on stage. <laughs> but the last time I had to was with my friend Carice. Mm -hmm. We sang this very dramatic duet song by Jennifer Lopez and Mark Anthony, No Me Ames. Oh, <laughs> yes. I think I've heard it. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. Sounds awesome. Leslie, would you rather have bananas as fingers or banana peels as feet? <sighs> banana peels as feet. Faux show. <laughs> because I love to dance. And I think if I had banana peels as feet, I'd be like all over that. And oh, you know, I'd probably be a much better break dancer if I had banana peels as feet. Good answer. Marcos, do you <laughs> look at us talking about dancing and music? Um, Marcos, do you rather dance tango or cumbia? Cumbia, sí. Me encanta la cumbia. I mean, tango is beautiful, but cumbia is very special. It's a dance that unites Latin America, is part of our popular culture, and it's so fun. Yeah, absolutely. I think we grow up uh, learning how to dance cumbia before we learn how to walk. <laughs> True. <laughs> Caleb, what fictional family would you be a member of? Uh, that, I would have to say, the House of Evangelista from Pose which it's about the ball scene from the 80s from queer culture and people would bind together as chosen family and name their collective houses. And anyway, watch Pose. It's amazing. Oh, I, it's on my list. It's on my list. Yeah, I will check it out. Leslie, Biggie or Tupac? Both great. Fantastic. But I'm going to have to go with Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg all the way. I actually, I remember in college, I, I dreamt that he was what, he was what camp counselor. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but yeah, I love Snoop Dogg. Well, I'm going to wrap it up y'all. It's just been such a great season. Thank you so much for, for the support, for the, for, for all the work that you all have done to support you know, to support this podcast. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. And to the listeners, thank you for joining us this season of I'll Go If You Go, the Save the Redwoods League podcast. I'm your host, Leslie Parra. Please stay tuned for season two in the coming months. And we hope to see you in the forest this summer. And may the forest be with all of us. Stay connected by following us on Instagram and Twitter at Save the Redwoods and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Save the Redwoods League.